Good afternoon. I'm Jacques Delisle, the director of the Center for the Study of Contemporary China uh, here at the University of Pennsylvania. And I want to welcome you to the second installment of our six weekly web webinars on the Penn, future, Penn Project on the Future of US-China Relations. Uh, last week, we had our first session on national security issues. This week, we'll be turning to trade and competitive issues. On behalf of Avery Goldstein, uh, who is my predecessor here as director of the center, and Nathan Makbubi, who is a fellow at the center, and both of whom are my co-organizers on this project, uh, we're delighted that you're joining us today. Just a brief reminder on the nature of, of the project, uh, for those of you who were with us last week and maybe for newcomers, we see this as an attempt to address policy issues at a moment that is something of an inflection point in US-China relations. The era of constructive engagement of, of uh, bringing China into the system and then believing that China is potentially a partner, which dominated American thinking about policy toward China for much, although not all of the first 40 years of the relationship, has in recent years turned to something a good deal more negative, a call on the US side for much tougher policies toward China that really is a bipartisan, if not consensus, at least a bipartisan departure from the prior consensus. The US, of course, is at this moment at the cusp of a presidential election, one that could have consequences uh, they're quite significant for US-China policy, especially coming after four years of the approach the Trump administration has taken, uh, which departed from its predecessors uh, in some significant ways. And on the Chinese side, of course, we have seen uh, the full emergence of what China's approach to the United States and the outside world is during the Xi Jinping era. So the headlines are kind of negative, but beneath that, there is a rich and complex multifaceted relationship. And the point of this project is to bring together mostly younger scholars who have academic depth in the particular aspects of the relationship that we think matter most and can bring that depth of academic expertise and knowledge to bear on policy relevant questions offering uh, operational, operationalizable uh, relevant policy prescriptions. Today's panel is certainly no exception to that model and I'm delighted uh, to have them here. Uh, let me introduce our three panelists today and then we'll turn to each of them in turn. Uh, first, Meg Rithmeyer. Uh, she is the F. Warren McFarland Associate Professor in the Business, Government, and International Economy Unit at the Harvard Business School. Uh, she's a political scientist uh, and uh, works on comparative political economy of development with a focus on China and Asia. Her book, Land Bargains and Chinese Capitalism, uh, was out a few years ago, and I certainly recommend it to anyone interested in that subject. Uh, she's currently working on a project which investigates the relationship between capital and the state and globalization in Asia, including China, obviously quite germane to today's topic. Uh, and uh, her project includes examining how governments attempt to discipline business and how business adapts to those things, uh, those policies. Next, Mark Wu. Uh, Mark Wu is the Henry L. Stimson Professor of Law at Harvard Law School. He served as the Director for Intellectual Property in the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative when he was the lead U.S. negotiator for the intellectual property chapters of several free trade agreements. He also worked as an engagement manager for McKinsey & Company, where he focused on high-tech companies. And before that, he was an economist and operations officer for the World Bank in China, working on environmental, urban development, health, and rural poverty issues. He also served as an economist for the United Nations Development Program in Namibia. Last but certainly not least is Matt Furchin, uh, who's joining us from another time zone. Uh, Matt is the head of global China research at the Mercator Institute for China Studies, uh, known as Merix, uh, to those of you who received their publications, uh, based in Berlin. His research focuses on the connections between China's foreign and domestic political economy. He's written extensively about China's economic statecraft, China's developing country diplomacy, and debates about the China model of development. Uh, for 10 years, uh, he was a faculty member in the Department of International Relations at Tsinghua University in Beijing. And from 2011 to 2019, he was a scholar with the uh, Carnegie Tsinghua Center for Global Policy. Uh, so just a couple of quick housekeeping matters before uh, we, we begin our, our panel uh, discussion here. Uh, let me just first of all thank those who have made this possible. That includes generous support from the China Research and Engagement Fund here at Penn, operated out of Penn Global and the Provost Office, and from the Henry Luce Foundation. We also partner with the Foreign Policy Research Institute, uh, and this project has its origins in a collaboration with the Next 40 project of Kaiser Guo. And none of this would be possible without many people uh, behind the scenes uh, making it work, including particularly our associate director at the center, uh, Yun Yanzong, and Amanda Morrison, who is our fellow for this project. A couple of logistics notes 
Uh, this is being done as a webinar format. So if you wish to raise a question or a comment, do it in the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen, uh, not raising your hand. Uh, the chat boxes you should watch. You will not be able to type into it as a, a participant or an audience member, uh, but there will be some announcements coming out to you in the chat box, including information on how to get access to the policy papers that uh, today's panelists have written, as well as to other outputs from the project and notice about future events. I think I've done all the housekeeping I'm supposed to do. So now let's get on to substance uh, and I'll start with uh, Meg Rithmeyer. So Meg, tell us about the, the, things, the things we really should um, uh, find most important and, and take as the big takeaways uh, from your topic and then we'll give you a chance to elaborate some beyond that. Um, thank you, um, Jacques, for the introduction and for organizing us. And again, thanks to the other organizers and the other people making all of this possible, and especially to Arthur Krober and Susan Thornton, who provided helpful feedback on a first round draft of my paper and others. So uh, my part of the project in my paper looks at the role of the state in the Chinese economy, how it's changed, how it's grown, and how it's constrained. Um, and the three big takeaways that I'd like to articulate um, for today, um, it starts with basically this insight that the role of the Chinese um, state, the Chinese party state, which I'll call the party state, in the economy has changed, has become more pronounced and qualitatively different over the last, let's say, eight to 10 years. Um, and we have recognized that toward the end of the Obama administration and certainly during the Trump administration as well. Um, and that's taken a number of different forms. So in previous eras, uh, we've been focused on the developmental logic of the state and the, and the state's ownership over um, state-owned enterprises, its majority ownership over firms, which we call SOEs. But in recent years, those roles have changed. So it continues to own um, state-owned enterprises, but also has enormous financial stakes in firms of all kinds of ownership throughout the Chinese economy. The state's also behaving as a venture capitalist, um, a role that's mostly associated with the Made in China 2025 campaign to upgrade technology and upgrade um, industrial production in China. And there's also been more political manifestations of the state's role in the economy, including the national security law of 2015, which gives the state enormous and vague powers over different enterprises, civil military fusion efforts, as well as more political attacks on the private sector um, that have become more pronounced in recent years. The second major takeaway is that we're still understanding exactly what this means about the state's power. So one of the biggest conclusions that many observers have taken is that now it's the party state that's in charge of every single firm in China, that there's no distinction between any firm from China doing anything domestically or internationally in the Chinese state. And this is far from the case. So in the paper, um, I talk about a couple of different things. And the main idea is that we should understand exactly how economic policymaking in China works, which is that it works not through a set of clear strategies, clear policies, and command mechanisms. It works through what we call campaigns, meaning political mobilization efforts, often with vague goals, and then basically all kinds of actors, both within the state and outside of the state, um, tend to pursue their own interests while using the language of that campaign, but not always doing things that are directed by Beijing or even what Beijing wants. So in the paper, I look at two very prominent campaigns which have figured um, importantly, and how the globe, and especially the US, has interpreted to the role of um, the state in China's economy. So first, Made in China 2025, and second, the Belt and Road Initiative, and two very high profile examples of semiconductors and the Sri Lankan port in Hambantota to show that, in fact, it's not that the state was directing different enterprises to do certain things, but it unfolds in this process of experimentation and learning. And in fact, a lot of these firms are doing things that subvert rather than manifest the interests of Beijing. And here I just want to briefly highlight um, how the economic realm in China is similar to Jessica Chen Wise's explanation of nationalism in the national security realm that she spoke about last week. So she says that China is not a monolith. And of course, that's not true, or that is true. It's not a monolith in the economy either. There are all kinds of firms and all kinds of people with all sorts of interests. And the primary goal of the Chinese Communist Party is its own domestic stability. And so a lot of what we see it doing in terms of taking more control of enterprises within China or trying to assert that control comes from a place of fear or weakness or a lack of control rather than is evidence of the state controlling absolutely everything. So lastly, what are the policy takeaways? Um, and there are several in the paper, but here I'll just mention um, a couple. So the first is not to overreact. So if we do interpret every action of any Chinese company as evidence of some kind of plan from Beijing, 
then we tend to both um, make erroneous conclusions about what Beijing's strategic really interests really are, and we tend to overreact in ways that could be counterproductive and costly. So for example, reconfiguring every American institution to deal with a new threat from China would only make our business environment sort of inscrutable to our own firms as well as other international firms who we do want doing business in the United States. And it would probably be overreacting to a kind of idea of China's strategy that doesn't really exist. I also talk about how we should focus and structure our competition with China around rules, institutional rules that are predictable and legible to all kinds of partners that, again, we want doing business with the United States. And lastly, we should be very clear about the costs and benefits of different policies. So, um, for example, as this is especially true, I think, when we think in terms of national security. So if we think every interaction with any Chinese firm of any kind has implications for national security, we may tend to approach policy in a sort of absolutist way. So for example, corporate espionage, we can think of as deplorable, but it's not always a national security problem. So being very clear about the costs of various pilot policies and the benefits of what we're actually going to get from those policies, I think um, is the most important thing we should think about um, when crafting policy to actually counteract China, or compete with China or engage with China in an era of a newly resurgent state in the economy. Thank you. Well, thanks, Meg, for that, that terrific overview of a rich paper. I'm going to pose uh, some questions to you to try and draw out a, a few things. So um, much of what you said in your remarks now and much, much of what you said in the paper is about the, the, the kind of uh, the argument that this, this is not an evil genius giant, right? Uh, and I think that runs through, through Matt's work. It ran through, as you said, Jessica Chan Weiss's uh, work from, from last uh, panel. Um, but you know the mood in the U.S. on these issues right now is really quite sour. You can look at Mike Pence and the whole of government, whole of society approach, the very kind of thing you're critiquing. Uh, so I guess I have a, a couple of questions on that. The first is, what about some of those areas that are part of the indictment of what China is up to that you get into some in your paper, but not so much in your remarks? The the kind of hard things to track down, like increasing party and state control over enterprises. You know, the party committees within enterprises. The the kind of um, cuttle toward the regime you see from, uh, from uh, private uh, enterprises. Uh, much hay has been made in Washington about the national security law in China and the obligation it imposes on actors who are not anywhere by any definition traditional state-owned enterprises, but to answer to the state. Um, so how do we sort of unpack that and is there anything U.S. policy can do to target those particular issues? Um, so thank you for that. I think, so first of all, let me say very clearly that it is true and it's undeniably true. So I'm not, I, I am not making the argument in the paper or here that the role of the state in the Chinese economy is, you know, limited, is, is purely limited or is, you know, much, much, much less than we think it is. In fact, it's more in many ways. Um, and so things like you referenced the 2015 national security law, which basically gives the state wide scope to commandeer the assets, whether they're data or other things of non-state enterprises under circumstances it perceives um, or, or deems to be national security relevant, right? So that is, in fact, a real um, issue that American policymakers have to contend with. The one distinction I think we ought to make is between how we interpret the actors of the Chinese state and how we deal with those contingencies. So if the reality is that, yes, it is perhaps true that you know, any, any given firm may not be that far from the state under certain circumstances, Logically, it's not also true that everything they do is an action on the part of the state, right? And so we have to think of that in terms of both offense and defense. So it's not as if everything that a Chinese firm does is part of Beijing's plan. In fact, sometimes it's subverting Beijing's plan. And so what I would want us to be attentive to is to not draw incorrect conclusions or overreact to things when firms are actually doing things that has nothing to do with what Beijing wants them to do, which is a different set of, of policy issues than basically readying ourselves for the contingency that some firm could eventually down the line, you know, team up with the Chinese government to do something we ought not do. So that, that would be the distinction I would make there. Okay, in your paper, you also make reference, uh, also in the vein of China not being a monolith, uh, to the now in eclipse, but still very much there, interest groups in the economy, in the firms, also in parts of government, certainly in, in the intellectual world, that have not turned against the story of some form of engagement, some form of benefiting from a more collaborative rules-based international order. Uh, so I guess I have two questions to you on that. One is, how much influence do you think those groups can hope to have in saying returning China to 
an agenda that was, you know, even in the third plenum of the 18th Central Committee, that they're moving forward with more market-oriented reform, and how about their counterparts in the U.S. side? Uh, that is, it's, it's long been that business was China's best friend in terms of good relations with the U.S., uh, and now for reasons that, uh, that Mark will certainly get into in his remarks, uh, there's, there's a certain amount of frustration that is built over the years. So is that transnational alliance of influence um, which will address some of your problems if it works. Is that, is that revivable? Is it, uh, is it uh, promising? Well, there's about 25 different dyadic relationships I can imagine basing an answer to that on. So I'm not sure that I could um, say something totally that would apply to any of them. And in fact, I do, um, I do have this insight in the paper that comes from Craig Allen, the um, president of the US China Business Council, that of course, American business is also not monolithic in its treatment of China. So there are lots of different interests that come from different sectors and different regions of the United States um, when we think about what US business wants and what its interests are. So it's not straightforward from our side either. Um, but I do think that, yes, it's correct that China, you know, there are still constituencies for liberalization in China. And yes, they're much more muted than they have been, partly because Xi Jinping's administration has been much more authoritarian. But we shouldn't act as if suddenly everyone in China has converged on his viewpoint. In fact, they're doing what Chinese actors have done for the past 70 years, which is figure out how to pursue their own interests while appearing to pursue the interests of the state. Um, the one thing I think we ought to be wary of is when we use certain tools that seem extra institutional or we do things um, I don't want to get too specific about it, but when we do things like threatening to delist all Chinese companies or, you know, over relying on things like the entity list to target specific companies um, in ways that, you know, sometimes that's entirely reasonable, but sometimes the perception is that, in fact, Chinese firms were never going to benefit from playing by the rules. So anything that we do to teach people the rules weren't meant for you um, and that, you know, it, basically there's no way for Chinese firms to participate in the global economy and still get ahead is more evidence that, look, this system was never going to work for us in the first place. And so that's why I really focus in my paper on recommending that we um, in the United States rely on rules and institutions that are predictable, that structure incentives and behavior and really abide by those rules um, so that we can also kind of you know, try to push other firms, including Chinese firms, to abide by those rules also. They have to mean something um, over the long term in order for them to really change those behaviors and create the, and give those power, give those constituencies any kind of power in China. Okay, one last question before I, I turn to our, our next panelists, because we do want to leave time at the back end of this for uh, our audience uh, Q&A. So okay. one of the points you make in the paper is that, that part of this U.S. tendency to uh, infer a nefarious plot is because a lot of it is very informal, it's campaign, it's, ad it's adaptive. Um, and you urge essentially a US approach where we get our rules right. And I guess the devil's advocate question is, you're essentially talking about a formalist rule-based rule order for dealing with a, a squishy thing that doesn't really, uh, in its contours, uh, map nicely on to the rules. And, and we see the flaws of the rule-based approach too. That is the US needs, still this need to put things in clear categories. And you know, the fact of the world is we treat investment from China differently. We treat investment from the Netherlands under, under Cynthia in ways that it's often hard fully to articulate um, uh, that don't lapse into being China bashing politics. So do you see a danger with this, this, this sort of clash of almost um, regulatory or legal cultures between self-conscious informalism that we read in a paranoid way and rule rigidity that may not be the best tool for dealing with what we're facing in China. Yes. <laughs> so yes. Yeah, so right, well, we're out of time, so move on. <laughs> <I'm kidding. laughs> yeah. um, so yes, that's very insightful. And yes, I think that's right. I mean, of course, it's difficult because what China, you know, what they're, they're doing, the, essentially the campaign style and the policy style of China is to put something out there, then tweak it on the back end and re-regulate and figure out how things work after you've had some pragmatic experience. But just to give a, a, you know, a hard example, institutions, when you think about institutions and roles, you know, political scientists think about institutions as being effective when they're flexible and adaptive, right? But nonetheless, do structure behavior and structure expectations. So, for example, when we think about CFIUS, the Committee on Foreign Investment that does regulate investment to the United States, CFIUS in many ways caught the deals that were the ones that were problematic. So it was overhauled in 2018, right after it was effective in catching some of the deals that shouldn't have gone through. Um, and so, you know, and economists talk a lot about a regulatory amnesia, which is, you know, we make a regulation to address the problem, then the problem appears to go away, and then decades later we think, 
that problem's not a problem anymore. So we deregulate only to have the problem again. And the opposite would be a kind of like regulatory autoimmune reaction or something where, you know, you see something, the regulations actually work, and then you think you need even more regulations to deal with it. And so, I mean, the one thing I would say is we should trust in the flexibility of our institutions. So something like CFIUS defines national security vaguely for a reason, because we expect that those threats will change, um, which doesn't mean we should dispense with those institutions constantly. It means we should trust in their adaptivity and flexibility. Um, and so I, I, I still think rules when, and institutions when they're, when, they're, when they're kind of designed effectively should be able to deal even with a kind of changing and amorphous threat and, and competition with China. I thank you for getting us quickly to the COVID uh, uh, analogy, which, which comes up at every discussion at all times. Right. <laughs> well, thanks, Meg. That's terrific. We'll be back to you in the general Q&A. Let me now uh, turn to Mark Wu, uh, who will talk to us about uh, the WTO element of uh, US-China economic relations and how to get us out of the mess we're in. Mark? Thank you very much, Jock, and to everyone at the Penn Center. And I also want to join Meg uh, and Matt in thanking Arthur and Susan for their comments on our initial drafts. Um, the trade war obviously has been front and center uh, over the last four years in the U.S. relationship with China. And so uh, to tackle the question about what do we do about China on trade is certainly too large of a topic for any one paper to handle. So what the organizers at the Penn Center asked me to focus on was to focus on the WTO element of it. And the WTO element, put very simply, is there's one camp uh, amongst the U.S. foreign policy establishment that believes very strongly, oh, it would be much smarter for the U.S. to work with its allies through a rules-based multilateral approach at, through the WTO, namely, uh, in order to deal with the China trade challenge. And so I looked at that question as to whether or not uh, that's a feasible strategy, what might be some of the constraints that stand in the way of that type of strategy, and what the policy recommendations would be that's come out from that question. And I just want to highlight three points from it. Uh, the first is something that WTO and trade experts are well familiar with, but many people in the foreign policy establishment may not be. And it piggybacks on the conversation that Jacques and Meg were just having. Uh, institutions and rules-based approach work when they are flexible and they are adaptable and the initial institutional design was correct. And what I highlight in this paper is that there are both structural deficiencies in terms of the WTO's institutional design, uh, as well as a outdating of the rules that actually pose major challenges in terms of turning to the WTO as an institution to deal with the China trade challenge. And I uh, won't go into great depth on those, but I'll highlight a few examples. Um, the rules, oftentimes we talk about taking China to the WTO to deal with trade challenges, but even when you win a trade case at the WTO, there's no a compensation for any of the past harm. So that provides a gap period whereby you can breach the rules without consequence in order to effectuate an industrial policy. And that's something that various Chinese sectors have taken well advantage of, right, that you can't necessarily deal with through the current institutional design. Another example would be on transparency. You're supposed to notify your subsidies, but there's no consequences if you don't. Uh, and then there are rules which are outdated in terms of the rules aren't up to date on or subsidies on uh, uh, over capacity on e-commerce, digital trade, uh, a number of the issues uh, have not been updated since the mid 90s. Um, so the common thought is, well, if the US could build a transnational alliance to then reform the WTO to deal with these issues, that would be a much more effective approach. And what I highlight in the paper is to say, well, in theory, that is certainly possible. There are a number of major differences between the US and its allies on these questions. Uh, and those touch on both the structural issues in the direction of reform, as well as the substance of the rules in terms of how they would be upgraded. And the last thing that I'll touch on is that even if those differences could be overcome, uh, there are a number of other obstacles that stand in the way before the WTO could be brought to bear. So the short conclusion that I reach in the paper is it's unlikely the WTO could serve as an effective forum in the next four years of the next presidential administration to deal with the China trade challenge wholeheartedly. That means that the U.S. will need to continue to employ a multi-pronged strategy that, while on the one hand does turn to the WTO, also turns to regional, bilateral, and possibly 
uh, other types of unilateral approaches to deal with the China trade challenge. That's not to say the WTO strategy that others have laid out is not one that should be pursued, but much of the work in terms of pursuing that strategy will be uh, on bridging those differences in the alliance and particularly between the U.S. and its European allies. Well, thanks, Mark. Uh, again, a terrific overview of a very rich paper, which I commend to anyone uh, listening to go read, but after we're done with our, with our, uh, our webinar here. Um, so, you know, uh, Mark, you're, you're well known for your China Inc. piece, uh, which goes into a lot of what it is about the Chinese system that the WTO doesn't work well with, and, and you're talking about ways inside or outside the WTO to pursue this. If you had to list your top few things, that the U.S. should seek allied cooperation to get China to change its behavior on. And that's, I know that's going to be an unholy mix of what do you think is really important, what do you think is feasible to get China to possibly to change, what do you think allies might get on board with. But what's your, where, where would you start uh, in terms of the, the many aspects of the Chinese system that you've identified as problems that are not well policed in the WTO order? Um, I think uh, Meg touched on several of these, right? Which is the Chinese system in and of itself is not this top-down directive monolith that we imagine it to be incorrectly. It's nimble, it's flexible, and parts of it are informal, opaque, and so forth. So it's the exact same challenge that Meg just defined, right? How do you define formal rules to deal with an amorphous, ever-changing entity that's proven to be quite resilient? I think um, you're never gonna be able to have rules that catch everything. So I think the things that the U.S. and allies are going to need to work on are areas where rules aren't well defined today, um, such as, and I think two of the major ones are dealing with uh, the digital dimension and also on the uh, subsidies as a whole, not just industrial subsidies, but subsidies with regard to services and other domains as well. Because this is where you're asking, where is there actually no laws or no rules of the road, or where Chinese policies are having negative spillover effects that distort uh, the playing field and have negative consequences for workers in not just the US, but other countries, including developing countries that are even poorer than China, right? So I think that's where probably the emphasis needs to be. But the other part that I would highlight is those rules are never going to be able to be complete. So I think the US and its allies need to come to a common understanding, which they failed to do over the four years to say, when the institution and the rules are unable to deal with this, then how do you respond? Right. I think one of the things that you go to go into in your paper and that many of your colleagues in this project do is, is to emphasize this isn't something that came out of nowhere. There are deep roots of U.S. dissatisfaction with the WTO, deep roots of dissatisfaction with China's behavior in the WTO, and it could go well beyond the WTO on both of those. But of course, we're operating against the background of the last few years. And the question is, how deep a hole have we dug ourselves in the approach to trade issues with allies and with China uh, over the last say four years, um, how much harder does that make it for the kind of agenda you're proposing of, of drawing common cause with allies who share some of the same concerns about Chinese behavior? Well, there's two parts of what I think what we need to do. There's a part about what we need to do at home, which is to recognize this is going to be a long-term challenge that we're not going to be able to negotiate some solution out of uh, in much the way that we were able to with the U.S.-Japan competition with the Plaza Accord and then series of trade agreements that followed from there. Right. So um, so taking care of what we need to do at home and then in conjunction with allies is something that I think we'll be able to if we actually had the political will to do so. And Congress was willing to devote the resources and to sort of bring the American uh, industrial complex to bear. I think it's something that's definitely possible. Uh, it's a question of political will. It's not necessarily tied to any, we, we squandered some opportunities, but they're ones we can quickly make up. The other question though is a diplomatic question and to say how much, uh, how much have people really developed such a negative uh, reaction towards US diplomats? Um, I think there is a reputational cost that will be in some ways, right? Once you've lost some trust, it's really hard to rebuild that. I think that may be permanent, but with a new set of diplomats in place, or even with a recognition that the current administration said diplomats, whether you like them or not, this is who's representing the United States because that's who the electorate has chosen, right? I think with that, um, diplomats everywhere are very pragmatic and will be able to deal with it. I think what the case we've seen right now is 
uh, in many capitals, they're hoping to have a new administration and to just wait out the U.S., much like the U.S. has hoped to wait out China over the last two decades. But once it recognizes you can't do that, um, people will deal quite pragmatically. But the reputation cost, I think, is perhaps the one that has been somewhat squandered uh, as a result of what's happened over the last, uh, not just the last four years, but over the last decade. So this may be getting a little bit beyond the scope of your paper, but it's certainly within your uh, your area of expertise more generally. So you, Meg is talking some about things the U.S. can do on its own, sort of unilateral changes to the way the U.S. approaches uh, China through legal and regulatory means. You're a bit of a skeptic about how much can be done in the WTO. So what would you prescribe that the U.S. do in its own uh, domestic trade-related laws, or what is it that we're doing badly that we should do better to address some of the concerns you're pointing to? Well, I think if you take not just the premise of this paper, but several of the papers that came out from last week's series, right? If you take as a given that we are in a long-term strategic competition, particularly on technology, uh, with spillovers beyond the economic realm into national security, if you take that as a given, then it's clear the U.S. needs to invest much more than it has on education, on basic research, on its own infrastructure and in a coordinated manner with its allies that doesn't necessarily turn to law or to rules as a way to manage that. In other words, you need to buttress up your capabilities for that, uh, for that competition in a way that we haven't quite done at home. Uh, and I think that's going to be absolutely critical. The other part that I think we need to do at home as well is to be much more robust in terms of monitoring and building in checks for when we fail to do that type of investment back into the U.S. industrial complex. What do we do in order to have breaks that are in there to catch that, to make sure that that's built into the system? Because right now the system almost seems to work on a, well, we need to find the funds to do it. If we, are, if we don't have the political will to tax on it, well, we'll just kick the can down the road. And we've kicked the can down the road far enough with a set of negative consequences that are coming home to bite for us now. So uh, to preview a little bit, I, I think uh, what uh, Matt will be talking about in a moment, again, you, you've uh, laid out the limits to a WTO-centric strategy, suggested uh, more uh, informal or diffuse alliance undertakings. One of the issues that's out there is, is China building a potentially rivalrous and rather different set of institutions that you know, can make the WTO or any US-led arrangement, if say the TPP were still around for the US, um, how much do you take that seriously? That is, how much does it complicate or, or at least exist around the, the edge of your analysis uh, that China has elements in the RCEP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, in some of the uh, Belt and Road Initiative uh, related undertakings that do at least to um, perhaps people who, who have the kind of uh, a dark and conspiratorial view that Meg talks about, but perhaps even to others beyond that, that look like a counter order or at least uh, creating an a set of, of institutions, organizations, and, and regimes that are, are options for China to activate and, and to do an end run around the kind of uh, WTO, US-led uh, types of arrangements you're talking about. Is there a Chinese alternative order out there that we need to worry about potentially emerging? Uh, not yet, but I think you framed the question nicely in terms of saying the Chinese are laying down options uh, for if they eventually would like to do that because they feel like the current set of institutions are, are, have turned against them. Uh, they are laying down that possibility to activate those options if necessary. But in some ways, that's what any major rising power has always done. So, uh, but what I will point to in the paper is, in many ways, the Chinese are a cooperative player at the WTO and invested in the WTO today. And I highlight in the paper on an issue, WTO appellate body, the Chinese and Europeans are actually aligned on their view of the approach. And it's the Americans who are the outliers here. It's just an example of right, these types of alliance differences. And the Chinese namely have figured out with this current set of international rules and through the WTO, how to push forward with the type of uh, growth strategy that we're seeing coming out of the next fifth year plan and to have this type of dual circulation. They figured out how to do that under the current set of rules. Uh, they could afford certain set of tweaks, so they're open to certain sets of reforms, right? They also recognize you need to have new rules on digital trade. So they're right, sort of right now sitting at the table willing to bargain, 
willing to negotiate with all of it. But the problem that I highlight is it's on the other side where the U.S. and the EU don't quite know how to respond to that. So, so there's certainly distrust on the Chinese, right? They didn't set up these rules, but they've learned how to play with them. But they think if the U.S. and the EU and so forth are going to move the goalposts, all of a sudden they're creating an alternative pitch just in case. Uh, that's where we're at in my view right now. And Matt will have a lot more to say on this because you all just asked me to look at the next four years and all this. And so my answer to you is certainly that, that they may be laying down the foundation, but we're not going to see those activated in the next four years. Uh, thanks, Mark. We'll be back to you in the general Q&A. I'll point out we have one question in the, in the Q&A box already that wants to go back to the 19th century. So we're <laughs> going to have a go a bit beyond the four years. Uh, it's, a, it's a good question. We'll get to that in a moment. But first, let me turn to uh, Matt Furchin to talk about uh, his paper on uh, the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative. Thanks, Doc. Uh, it's great to be a part of the discussion today, and I feel like uh, I've already been set up really well here for what I'm going to discuss, and also would like to echo the thanks to both Arthur Coburn and Susan Thornton for their feedback on a first draft uh, of the paper. Um, so my remit was quite broad uh, in a way to look at uh, China's Belt and Road Initiative, but more generally at China's um, economic foreign policies, especially in a broad range of uh, geographical areas, including Southeast Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Um, so let me cut to the three main insights uh, of my paper. Um, the first uh, is that in recent years, U.S. policymakers and pundits have tended to overestimate China's ability to turn wealth into power. More specifically, in recent years, the U.S. has tended to misjudge and overestimate China's abilities to easily translate its growing trade, investment, and financial ties to its neighbors in Southeast Asia and other developing country regions like Africa and Latin America into clear Chinese dominance at the expense of other countries in those regions and of American influence and interest there. In reality, uh, the story has been much more complex as China's ability to turn commercial interdependence, including through its Belt and Road Initiative, into leverage and influence has at times been hampered by mistakes and missteps that have led to unintended outcomes, which have not only limited China's influence, but also undermined its commercial and diplomatic interests. So you'll hear clear echoes uh, in that, in what Meg said, and I, I think also elements of what Mark just discussed. Uh, the second insight of my paper is at the same time as there has been this overestimation, uh, at the same time there has been in recent years, US policymakers and pundits have tended to underestimate the appeal of China's development themed foreign economic policies. So the increasingly dominant zero sum US framework, which I categorize as geoeconomics, uh, for understanding China's foreign economic policies, including its Belt and Road Initiative, has also underestimated the diplomatic and material attraction of China's development themed economic statecraft in regions like Africa and Latin America, but also in parts of Southeast Asia. In particular, China's rhetoric of mutual development and its increased commercial engagement both resonate in many countries where leaders use and sometimes abuse China's diplomatic and commercial outreach for their own interests. Again, echoes of some things that Meg mentioned there. Um, the US gives the impression, however, of Harvey of largely having ceded the field of development or of a vision of prosperity to China. And lastly, the US must better understand the role and interests of governments and citizens in China's developing country deal-making partners. More careful attention to the interests and calculations of China's developing country partners highlights that China is not, only, is not the only actor involved in BRI or other deal-making. Elements of both the appeal and the problems with China's foreign economic deal-making can often be traced back to host country realities. For the U.S. to move toward a more competitive and self-confident response to China's own foreign economic policies, it will need to better understand the interests, needs, and challenges of China's developing country partners. Well, uh, thanks, Matt. Uh, uh, again, a concise overview of a, of a big topic and some big questions. So one of the things you get into in the paper is some of the details about the US responses to that. And of course, there are pieces such as the Build Act, the Blue Dot uh, undertakings, the transparency in, in infrastructure. Um, Chinese sources are kind of skeptical or contemptuous almost about, about how effective any of that is going to be relative to the scale 
of, of the BRI. Uh, maybe that's a little bit of whistling past the graveyard, a little bit of uh, sort of uh, claiming unconcern when there is some. But it, what, if any, is the merit to this Chinese view that this is, uh, for all of its flaws, and many of them recognize it in China, that the BRI is just a much bigger deal than anything the U.S. is going to bring to the table in terms of competing for a presence and even if not in a geoeconomic strategic sense, having influence uh, in, in uh, the targeted countries. Well, I think they have a point. I think one of the themes of, of my paper is that the, uh, the U.S. needs to step up to the plate. I think some of uh, the Build Act, the, the Blue Dot Network, is ideas for sustainable infrastructure. I think those are, are headed in the right direction, and they're more positive than a lot of the messaging uh, and responses that uh, U.S. diplomats have had, especially in regions like Africa and Latin America, uh, uh, where secretaries of state, um, Tillerson and Pompeo, have, have portrayed China as simply a bad actor and for countries to, to stay away. So these are, these are steps in the right direction. Um, they tend to be relatively limited um, and they still tend to be somewhat punitive. Uh, I think the idea is, well, the U.S. will be out there setting standards along with partners in maybe Europe and, and in, in Asia, but it's a little bit unclear uh, what happens if uh, others don't sort of agree to comply with those standards or do they just start ignoring them? Then what's the sort of positive element of, of the U.S. counter offer? I think there's at least one element of a sort of rhetorical or public diplomacy challenge here because the fact is the U.S. is a major player uh, in trade, investment, and finance in these different regions. Um, same, I think the, the EU has some of these same challenges of sort of portraying their already large commercial involvement uh, in these regions and sort of highlighting what that's about just because they do it differently. I think, you know, the, the U.S. government uh, doesn't have state-owned enterprises or policy banks in the same way that, that China does, and, and it doesn't control the messaging in the same way. So part of it's about messaging, but part of it's also about resources. And in the paper, I also talk about vision. Uh, China can sort of take the belt and road as, as sort of amorphous and sometimes chaotic as it is, they can take it a long way just from the symbolism of it. I think the U.S. needs to get back in the game of having a vision of what the U.S. can contribute that is that is larger and, and uh, more um, more proactive than has been the case in, in, in the last years, and maybe even since the end of the Cold War. Uh, that, your response leads me to two questions I'll ask uh, in, in sequence one at a time. So, China has, as you note in, in the paper and in your remarks, uh, has had some struggles with the BRI. I mean, it's, it's gotten tarred with charges of debt trap diplomacy. Uh, it's gotten the blowback from locals who aren't too happy with either the terms of the deal at the kind of government level or the sort of impact on the ground, whether it be environmental, local jobs, things like that. And there was an attempt to rebrand. Uh, yeah, there was the conference a bit over a year ago that the sort of relaunch of it. Do, what do you see as the prospects for China getting it, uh, if not right, at least righter, uh, in terms of some of the acknowledged weaknesses of the BRI, which again, even not characterize the geoeconomic strategy, but just as, as something that China wants at least to go well and get some, uh, some diplomatic gains from? What yeah, I think you're exactly right that China has heard these different messages, some of which I point out in the paper. It's, it's no mystery that there have been problems uh, with deal making, with debt, with a, a variety of the kinds of finance and investment and infrastructure and other kinds of engagement China's had uh, in all the regions that I, that I mentioned, Southeast Asia, Africa, Latin America, and elsewhere. Um, and there have been responses. We see this in the Belt and Road forums. Now there's been two of them. Um, one stream of this is China's committed to making the Belt and Road green. Uh, in response to concerns about China's financing and building of coal-fired power plants, for example. Uh, and then there's also just the sort of sustainability of, of debt. They've heard this message. Um, China proposed to put a multilateral body uh, at the World Bank. It's now housed at the AIB, this MCDF um, place where they, they can sort of coordinate more sustainable financial outcomes, but they're not really getting a lot of traction there. I think a lot of countries are wary um, of the fact that uh, China probably won't include the policy banks, the Export-Import Bank, and the China Development Bank in those commitments to more sustainable finance, 
So I think this is just another area where the US, but hopefully in cooperation with others in Europe and, and Asia, can come to the table with other, with both competitive offers of their own, but also potentially opportunities to work with China when it hears that others also have a vision and an interest in moving toward more sustainable, you know, whether it's infrastructure or lending. Uh, so I think with the U.S. kind of out of the game and mostly sitting on the sidelines and chastising China, it makes it really difficult for others, including in the EU or, for instance, Japan, to really get much traction. And on things like climate change, for example, China can sort of sit back when the U.S. Is, has taken its foot off the pedal. So a uh, related question that, that ties back into the capacity building theme you address in your paper. Uh, and you're critical of the kind of old 1960s development, law and development agenda, you know, here's, here's how to, to be a, an economic success and avoid being part of the Soviet bloc, you know, that whole thing. And you're, you're, you're also critical of the Washington consensus kind of heavily prescriptive approach that we saw in the post-Cold War era. Um, so if you could say a little bit more about, I guess, two things. One is what you see as being the version of that that would work. Uh, or might work for the kinds of, of things you're approaching. You talk about civil society and things like that. Um, and the other is whether we're headed toward possibly a kind of uh, contest of models, because even taking a non-conspiratorial view of the BRI, inevitably with that kind of presence, there are things that are going to come in in terms of governance, corporate governance, regulation, dispute resolution, things which do affect the institutional uh, landscape and governmental capacity on the ground in recipient countries. Yeah, thanks for both of those questions. I think, so I do call for more U.S. engagement, especially with developing countries or those countries where the U.S. Is, seem to be most concerned about China's nefarious influence, uh, again, Southeast Asia in particular, um, and at, at the sort of the government level, civil society, and, and business level to help build capacity in those countries. Because I've heard and seen demand for this at all, the, all these different levels. Um, I also realize, however, that um, I'm, I, may be, um, I may be asking for something that I regret seeing come into being. Um, and this goes back to the sort of development decade and sort of third world competition between the US and Soviet Union and China in the 1960s and 70s. Um, but I think for the US to be completely out of that game, uh, to not really have a vision or understanding of what it is that countries want and need in, and why it is that some of China's um, economic involvement, its, its loans, its investment, even its provision of coal-fired power plants, why there tends to be a demand and attraction for that. I think there needs to be a better understanding of that. And that's really where the vision comes from, the sort of redoubled effort on the part of American diplomats, civil society, and business to understand the situation on the ground in the countries where China is most active, but also where the US has important strategic interests. So I think part of it begins with, with this better understanding. Um, does that lead to a difference in, in our contest of models? We're already there. Um, I think we've been there for a while. I think the US has been sitting back on its laurels um, in terms of what the US model is. How, do we even know what it is at this point? The US has gotten out of structuring trade deals in, in the region. Uh, it's not clear to me what the US interests are in terms of articulating those uh, in, in public diplomacy uh, in terms of the developing world. It poo-poo's China's development strategies, but doesn't really seem to offer an alternative. So I think this, uh, I think we need to avoid moving toward these sort of hardened ideological models, but I do think there needs to be some hard questions asked about what it is that the U.S. wants to present as an alternative vision, and maybe there's overlap. Some areas for cooperating with China, but when that's not possible, then working with partner countries in those areas, in those regions where US interests are the clearest. Okay, well, thank you to all three of you. I want to remind our audience that the Q&A uh, box is open, so please uh, submit your written questions. I'm gonna uh, weigh in with some of them that have come in so far. Uh, here's one from one of your uh, fellow contributors to the project. Uh, who uh, says, I think uh, quite accurately, that one of the themes, particularly in um, Matt's paper and, and Meg's paper, is that China is not 100 feet tall, right? It's not as powerful as we think it is. It doesn't have a coherent uh, strategy. Um, but the questioner asks, does that really contradict the notion uh, 
that China's approach is good enough. You know, it, it, that is, it is, although imperfect and flawed and at times self-defeating, making mistakes and so on, it can still press on and achieve its goals with a fairly high degree of, of efficacy and that this can come at at least the relative expense of U.S. interests, especially if the U.S. is absent from the playing field or battlefield. Um, so I'll throw that out to, I guess I'll start with uh, Meg on this and then if anyone else wants to weigh in, feel free. Sure, I'm not surprised it's a smart question coming from him. So, I mean, I think, yes, that's right, right? So yes, the fact is that a lot of what China has done for the last 40 years is muddle through in a lot of ways, right? And so, I mean, Barry, not, this is not my idea, it's Barry Naughton's idea, right? That when we think about how Made in China 2025 works, they're gonna throw a trillion, right, in investment at something and act like a venture capitalist. Well, you know, venture capitalists, like the students that I teach, right, they expect for, you know, most of their investments to fail, the vast majority of their investments to fail. All they need is one to do well, and then they do well, right? And, and so the same could be true, basically, of how we think of the Chinese Communist Party, that a lot of what they're doing is going to waste resources, generate all kinds of blowback, um, generate all kinds of principal agent problems, as we call them, and, but, you know, some of it will succeed. And so it's not, it, it wouldn't be my argument that basically they're, that, you know, they're totally not in control and we should ignore what they're doing because it's likely to fail. I don't think that that's true at all. In fact, I think that a lot of what they'll do will eventually succeed. What I want to do is two things. What I would recommend is first being a little more aware of how the process works, right? So instead of China learning, experimenting, failing, and the rest of us interpreting everything they're doing as, oh, okay, so that's what they want to do. That's their strategy. We have to learn and experiment along with them. So understand when they're pivoting, understand when they've received feedback mechanisms that are making their strategy change, and no failure when we see it in China instead of assuming that everything that they're doing is intentional. Um, but this issue of like, yes, they're throwing a lot of resources at something, and of course it's true that, you know, some percentage of it is going to succeed, and it's important. And the answer to that, and let me just say wholeheartedly, I agree exactly with what um, my colleague Mark Wu said about a lot of this is going to require investments at home that are proactive and offensive, not in trying to counter what China's doing all over the globe, even when it's unnecessary, but making sure that at home we have the resources, we have the knowledge, we have the investments, um, rather than just stopping China from doing everything, that we're making sure that our industries can compete, that we have the intellectual pipeline, the research pipeline, and so that is a critical thing. I would much rather us um, waste some of our resources by investing at home than waste our resources by overreacting to what China is doing abroad. Um, so that would be my response. Uh, great, thanks. So we'll turn uh, next to Matt to weigh in on this and then to Mark. Yeah, just a couple of, of observations to pick up on, on that. The first is something that's sort of obvious but, but also pretty different um, from the, the Naughton argument of experimentation uh, and, and learning. It's one thing for China to have done that domestically. It's another for that, for it to do it beyond its own borders. Um, there are different kinds of consequences for China for that, for other countries, uh, and, and certainly for the US. I'd argue it's, it's, it's much riskier and also just in terms of China's ability to sort of come in and learn and, and, and change the process, but also um, I think we see what's happened with this pushback against debt trap diplomacy when the U.S. misinterprets or chooses to misinterpret that, then uh, the, the U.S. also can react in ways uh, that, that is unhealthy as this sort of experimentation plays out. So I think we need to understand, this is just an argument to understand the process better. Um, if things are not going right uh, in certain Chinese deal making when there's outcomes on sustainable Debt, um, local protests, all of these kinds of things. We need to understand why that's happening. Maybe there's a chance that China can, can learn better. Certainly, in my argument is that host countries need some assistance in helping to learn to deal with China because it's one thing for the US or the EU or Australia to deal with this um, experimentation process. It's quite another for poorer, smaller countries um, to, to deal with it. So there are consequences to this experimentation. Uh, and, and I think there are ways of improving it. So yes, it's imperfect and maybe China can muddle through, but, but at least I think that there should be lessons learned and that, ex that, that sort of learning process is one that many can be involved in, including the US. Okay, uh, Mark. Um, so I think Alex's paper, or Alex's question gets at one of the themes that comes out in my paper, which is um, 
we need to recognize that in the short term, at least, we are in a state of relative competition with China, particularly in some of the realms where there are uh, economic and national security linkages and where there are well-defined rules of the road. And so the theme of my paper was um, it's unrealistic to expect that we could bridge those differences and reach a new understanding in the short term with China on that. So what I was picking on in my conversation, picking up on my conversation with you, Jock, was if that's the case, then how much we invest relative to China certainly shapes the efficacy of China's uh, response. And in many areas, uh, we are not investing enough in ourselves, and that's allowing the Chinese, imperfect as it is, to still pick up relative advantage. The other theme, right, and I think that was the gist of Alex's question, but the other theme that I want to pick up is, um, again, something that you asked me about, Jacques, and I think also Matt touched on in his presentation. Um, you know, the Chinese know what they don't want, and they are determined to use whatever resources to make sure that that does not happen. And I think that's true in the global economic governance scheme. They know what they what strategy they have domestically at home to sort of keep building the China dream. And they know what type of external environment will not be conducive to it. So what we're seeing is not necessarily this grand plan that's being executed externally in the same way that there is a, uh, that there's this ideological competition, but there is this competition between models and a pushback against um, setting the stage in a way that would be detrimental to those interests. And how they view the external environment will continue to evolve based on how, what's happening at home. It's a different mode of this type of dual circulation that the Chinese um, thinkers are so fond of talking about. Uh, and I think we need to recognize that that's contingent upon how we react as well here and um, how we do so with allies. And what I touched on in my paper is we're nowhere close to being on the same page as our allies. And that's perhaps our most fundamental problem right now. Well, uh, uh, thanks. So we've got some other questions here and I, I do want to remind our participants that the Q&A box is open. So there is some, some uh, space there that, that I think we'll still have time to get through if you haven't put your question in yet. So um, I detected a bit of a shout out from, from Meg and actually from others on the panel to Kang Yue, that self-strengthening movement the U.S. needs to, uh, to look into at home. So I'll, I'll turn to our, our 19th century uh, question in, in the chat box, which is to what extent, I'll start with Mark on this since his paper is explicitly about trade. Uh, how do trends in U.S.-China trade disputes today echo or differ from their historical trade disputes going back to the 1800s? Well, I think there are some excellent historians who can do a much more thorough job than I can on this. But I think uh, U.S. trade policy towards China has vacillated between what one might characterize as almost a missionary type of approach of believing that we can use a, our statecraft, um, including economic statecraft, but not necessarily limited to it, right, to transform China domestically and to work with a set of internal reformers by which to do that. I think there was certainly that view in the 1800s. Uh, there was that view, again, in the Republican period, and there has been that view, right, in the reform era. And then on the other end of it is to say, China is China with a 5,000 year history. It's immutable, right? We'll never quite um, be able to influence it. We need to take China as a given. And that may be a rival, and then we need to shape our policy towards that. And so I think we're seeing the pendulum sort of swing from one end towards the other, towards the other. And I don't touch on this in my paper, but what I will say here is the arc of that pendulum turned very much on how we deal with our own domestic consequences of what comes out from the China trade at home. And that is much larger than it has been at any other point, right? Um, in the 1800s, it might have mattered for the whaling industry. Uh, in, the, right, in the 1900s and so forth, right, you had certain um, groups with uh, stakes inside China and for trading interests, but it didn't have quite the same blowback that it has in our global era today. And that's going to increase even further once we get into this internet of things, fourth industrial revolution, where everything is gonna be interlinked on the digital realm. And so in that sense, it, it, there are echoes of the past, but we're in a very different mode of competition today because of the technology. Uh, Matt or Meg, do you wanna weigh in on 19th century trade disputes? Yeah, Matt. So I won't, I'll, I'll bring it up more, more recent. Um, but in my paper, I, I touch on at least, I think the, another, his, more recent historical uh, 
um, background that is important for, I think, the Belt and Road Initiative, but also this argument of mine that a lot of what China is focusing on is an effort to be seen as the leader and agent uh, of development worldwide, that this, this, this central focus on development uh, and its relations with developing, country, with developing countries in regions like Africa, Latin America, and I think Asia fits in this in a trickier way. This has roots. Um, going back to the, the 50s, certainly the 60s, there's some really good historical research just from the last five years about the Sino-Soviet competition in the third world, developing world, US-China competition uh, in, in the third world. Um, China has a history here, and we sort of tend to think of things like the Belt and Road as sort of out of nowhere. Um, but I think going back and looking more carefully at these historical trajectories, but also the challenges that China has had, it's long aspired to lead the developing world or the third world or however it is, it's framed it. Um, but there's been a lot of ups and downs in that process. I think it helps to put that in perspective. Yeah, it's a fair point. We have seen uh, swings in that over the decades and there is a tendency and yeah, certainly our, our center, which focuses on post-79 events, it's easy to have amnesia about earlier moments of kind of Chinese evangelism for a Chinese model. We certainly saw it in one form in the Mao years. If you go way back, you see it in you know, bringing the barbarians near and transforming them to Chinese ways of doing things. And, and you know, one should not lose sight of that. And, and there is the risk of getting blinded by what had been a 40-year process of China mostly seeming to converge and move toward uh, liberal market post uh, Cold War uh, types of, uh, of, of norms. And uh, yeah, it's, a, it's a useful reminder um, uh, from the questioner that we, we have a, a deeper history there. Um, OK, so uh, there's a question here for uh, directed primarily at, at Meg, but others should feel, to, uh, feel free to weigh in. Um, so basically, the question says you, you've, uh, you've portrayed this picture of how uh, the party state pursues its goal in the, goals in the Xi era. And the questioner posits that to some extent, the success is the momentum of what was done before Xi and that some of Xi's tactics may actually not be uh, terribly, um, motion central ice just now, may not be terribly effective at continuing uh, down this path of, of economic success. So how long does the adaptive innovative approach remain viable as risk taping, taking becomes more difficult and dangerous uh, when you've got an increasingly ideologically rigid and centralized and party state intervening system? That's also, that's also a very good question and I fully agree with the premise, right? So, um, so there's kind of two ways to think about it. So there's this um, argument, which is, you know, really at this point, knowledge accumulation and consensus in the, in the field of Chinese political economy, which is that um, that basically China has been successful within the context of what we think of as like pretty rigid or sclerotic Leninist institutions by having this ability to have adaptive policy to experiment in some place and nationalize a program when it works and then adapt, you know, learn and adapt and that kind of thing. So, um, but the you know, questioner is right that that requires um, that requires information to be clear. It requires, you know, local officials to feel comfortable taking some sort of risk. Although it's not always been the kind of like bottom up thing. You know, there's a lot of what Sebastian Heilman has called experimentation under hierarchy. So the hierarchy has always been there. Um, but, you know, we are in a different kind of um, era now. And I think, you know, there are a bunch of good arguments out there called Minzner's book. Um, Elizabeth Economy's book about basically how the C era is different, right? That there is a kind of po political recentralization, um, a politics of fear in many ways, where a lot of these mechanisms of feedback from the from below um, are are more closed than ever, and risk taking, in, you know, in a good direction of trying to do policy interventions, you know, in within Chinese domestic politics, like you know, may not work. So. Um, so I think we could we can think about that as a process that requires a kind of openness um, and a, a kind of decentralization and central local relations that we don't know where that process is headed yet. And I, I'm not willing to say. I mean, I know that we're you know eight years into the C era, or, you know, but I, but I I still think it's a little bit too soon to think about that because 
Um, you know, a lot of what that requires also, that kind of um, experimentation and the, the success with it is party discipline. And I think that's what Xi Jinping wants. And so whether that pendulum swings too far in the other direction, I think is unknown. But I, I do agree with the premise that the more authoritarian and the more politically centralized China becomes, the fewer the opportunities for that kind of experimentation and open feedback that have been the secrets to success. On the other hand, when it comes to what China in the US context, so that's a Chinese kind of domestic context, but when it comes to thinking about competition with China, and you know, again, I agree with Mark's premise that in the short term, um, we are in a competition with China that, um, that you know, is, is profound in some places like technology and, you know, and, and not so much in others. And so I wouldn't agree with that it's a whole of society threat in that sense, but I do think there are areas in which we should view the relationship primary, primarily as one of competition. Um, but when it comes to what that, you know, when China goes abroad and that sort of thing, um, the, the mechanism of adaptation and experimentation is still about learning. It's still about learning. That learning is about how to discipline domestic actors as much as it is learning about things that Matt's describing in his work about blowback from other countries. You know, you know China is also learning, as he describes, you know, that these sorts of loan terms do work, these sorts of things don't work. Um, and so, you know, I still think that those mechanisms will probably work as they figure out, you know, how to do that, right? You interacting with Sri Lanka and Malaysia doesn't work in this way so now they have new sets of terms and new, way, new ways of dealing with it and so the basic structure of how China does its policy is still intact although I agree that some of the big benefits from it um, those benefits have attenuated as China's become more authoritarian okay uh, so another question that, that's come up here overlaps a little bit of what we've been talking about uh, but so we've talked some about what the U.S. can do within existing institutional orders, Mark, the WTO, others on other issues, and, and Matt about the um, possible alternative arrangements that grow out of, of the BRI and so on. Uh, it's one of our questions asked, what about China's agenda for changing the system from within? That is, China acquiring greater influence at existing international institutions and getting some of its way uh, by changing those rules. There are dramatic examples like the UN Human Rights Council, of course, but you can see it happening within uh, things in the uh, somewhat less uh, in your face uh, economic uh, sphere. And, and uh, because I started with referencing the WTO, I'll throw this first to Mark. So the point that I wanted to highlight in my paper is the dynamic is exactly the opposite at the WTO, right? In most other institutions, you think about China, let's say, for example, the World Bank or the IMF, right? You think about China is being the champion of the reform agenda because the rules um, don't give it its commensurate share of influence and so forth. Right? Um, it wasn't seated at a table when it shaped those rules. Um, that was true also at the WTO, but the, like I said in my paper, the Chinese have figured out a development strategy that has learned to live with those rules. It has never accepted those as being absolutely fair. And you look at it, China took on more commitments in WTO accession than other developing countries, but China has learned to live with it. So that's a, it's a strange dynamic to be in where all of a sudden the people who wrote the rules, right, the US, the Europeans and so forth, realize, oh, we didn't do good enough a job writing them because as I've highlighted in some of my scholarship, we didn't anticipate correctly all of the different dimensions of the China challenge. And so we're inside the WTO, the Chinese are now in this position where they don't necessarily need to reform. Um, they could reform if it's useful for their own domestic interests and on e-commerce and things along those lines, it may well be, right? But their main agenda here is to block US, European, Japanese, right? Whatever alliance reforms that would harm their development agenda. And so it's an interesting dynamic to look at that's fundamentally different than most other international institutions. So what do we see the Chinese doing in that type of uh, setting, right? Which is different, albeit than say the UN Human Rights Council or even the IMF, right? You see them um, acquiring influence, but very subtly, right? China is already along with the US, one of the major contributors to WTO's budget. But it likes to point out, we haven't put any quid pro quos on the budget along the lines of how the Americans threatened to hold up the budget because of the appellate body issue or some things along those lines, right? The Chinese uh, former ambassador and minister, uh, uh, minister um, is one of the four deputy director generals of the WTO, right? China has sponsored an internship program 
for developing countries looking to accede to the WTO. So China is sort of positioning itself as a, we believe in incremental reform, but along the lines of what's required for other developing countries and building that type of coalition. And what I highlight is that's a fundamentally different dynamic than most other international institutions, which presents a big challenge to the US and allies. As, and as the questioner uh, points out, the US in some of these areas has um, sort of vacated uh, the field. And so you have things like uh, Xi Jinping and actually before him, uh, Wen Jiabao, uh, showing up and talking about China being the defender of the status quo of economic globalization. Exaggerated claims, perhaps, but, but room to make them. Um, Matt or Meg, do you want to weigh in on this issue or should we move on to our next question? We're good? Okay. So uh, let, let me take up one here that I think is a thread that runs through a lot of, um, of your papers. So especially in, in Matt's and Meg's papers, so I'll start with them. Uh, there's a story that we shouldn't view China as a monolith or as this sort of coordinated, um, uh, coherent juggernaut as some of the questions gotten into. And you talked about the weaknesses on the U.S. side, things we could do better, uh, in a sense, to handle this. And I want to sort of do the, I guess it's the converse, the obverse of that question maybe, which is, in the things that you describe about how Chinese domestic politics and related concerns shape what China is doing, concerns about security, concerns about development, all these sorts of things, do, do those fissures do the, or those agendas, those priorities, uh, give points of leverage and influence other than the ones that we've been talking about, which is you know, aligned with your allies uh, and that sort of thing? Uh, do, do, does that provide something of a roadmap about how the U.S. can pursue some of the goals that you think the U.S. should pursue by being cognizant of what's going on in terms of the domestic imperatives in China in a way that goes beyond it's not an evil monolith? Uh-oh, I've stumped the path. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll just pick up on, on one of these themes. It seems to me that, that um, one of the areas where there's some tension is uh, in terms of China's overseas activities relates to, for example, China's efforts to ensure food security or, or energy security. Uh, and those are legitimate concerns on China's side to maintain, I think any country would have them to maintain energy or, or food security. And I think there is a way in which this also explains some of China's overseas activities, including Belt and Road kinds of activities. And if those are really sort of related to domestic concerns that China has, the US by exacerbating those concerns may actually make the situation worse. Um, but it can also understand those concerns, but also be competitive at the same time. This is where I think basically, depending on the results of the election, uh, I would anticipate that the United States might get much more involved, for example, in energy diplomacy, both in Asia, but also potentially in working with China uh, under the Obama administration. And I think the second Bush administration, there was a lot more uh, active US energy diplomacy, including with China basically saying, oh, the Amer America is more energy abundant now. We can be a good partner for you, not only selling you more gas, but also helping you structure your entire energy infrastructure in a way that lets you maybe have the same kind of energy revolution the US has. So, we're understanding some of those concerns um, and reasons why China's overseas behavior is taking shape as it is might actually also provide some opportunities for engagement with the U.S. or at least competitive U.S. behavior um, globally in regions where the U.S. is right now concerned about Chinese behavior. Um, yeah, I'll take a stab in the sense that, so there, there are kind of two things, right? So two insights that I would say that come from my paper on this. Um, one is that, uh, yes, China's not a monolith. There's all kinds of people doing all kinds of things from China, and China doesn't like all of those things. So for example, um, you know, and I have other work that's on this, but a lot of what we've seen in terms of China's overseas development, or overseas investments, rather. So, you know, is China buying the world? China's buying up all this stuff in Europe. And there was a recent publication that came, you know, out, the Chinese state is behind so much of the investments in Europe. And actually, it may not quite be aware of that, right? Because a lot of what firms have been doing from China, especially when they invest in things like hospitality chains and real estate and things like that, that's asset expatriation rather than strategic investments on the part of Chinese SOEs. And because there are political shareholders that are hidden well behind those businesses, 
exactly does it doesn't mean at all that this is what Beijing wants them to do right this is a way for the Chinese capitalist class who are nervous right or you know corrupt politicians from China to try to expatriate their assets and so if we interpret that right as you know oh China is trying to buy real estate in Europe in strategic places you know that's exactly the wrong conclusion right and then you can see what China is doing which is you know they push everyone you know everyone go out you know firms go out and then a bunch of the crony firms from China think well great that's great license for me to go do whatever I want to do and then you see that the political pushes towards going out are followed by like a, 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 a re-regulation oh no now we're gonna have to realize we have to put capital controls on this and this and this because they're trying to discipline those people so you know part of it is learning Learning. But then the other insight, which is that what China primarily wants is its own domestic security. That is the number one concern, right? So, you know, when we think about Made in China 2025, um, you know, where does it all come from? Well, a lot of it, and if you go back, and I've done some work in semiconductors, and if you go back, a lot of it has its origins in letters that industry leaders, for example, in semiconductors wrote, um, you know, to the premier um, years ago, right, saying, look, we are, we need more self-sufficiency in this industry. We depend on the U.S. for various points of the supply chain. And then the Snowden revelation showed that, in fact, the U.S. was using backdoors and chips, you know, to look at China before we ever accused Huawei of trying to do that with us. And so, you know, that's kind of like analogous to what Matt's saying. The more that we do those kinds of things, the more we teach you know, certain constituencies in China that, you know, by relying on Americans or by doing all of this stuff, it's, it's all bad news for you and push towards this different, more securitized view of things. Um, and so, you know, I can't recommend we go back in time and undo those things. Um, but, you know, but the point is being cognizant further that, you know, it's one thing to say, you know, we are in a strategic competition with China. It's another thing to say, we will not permit the country to have food security. You know, that is not, that is not in our strategic interest to say China shouldn't have food security, right? So trying to block everything that that country does only produces a kind of nationalistic politics and remits power back to a certain group of people who say that any kind of like reasonable global engagement is only likely to, to, to make China lose, right? So we have to, again, that comes back to being thoughtful about the costs and benefits of certain policies. Well, as those last remarks remind us, uh, we have a seamless web of issues in US-China relations, uh, looping us back to the security issues, and particularly as, as the papers this week have pointed out, the problem of securitization, as it were, of, of, of economic issues, um, and that, that we may be in uh, a, a, an environment which is going to make the kinds of solutions that Matt and Mark and Meg are suggesting perhaps even more difficult if the risk of decoupling uh, driven by security concerns amplified by COVID and so on uh, becomes baked in uh, to how we, we grapple with these problems. So lots to talk about. Uh, we are unfortunately out of time today, but I do want to thank Mark and Matt and Meg, uh, our three panelists for their excellent comments today, for the excellent papers, which you can all find at the website that is now listed in the chat function. I want to thank all of our participants in this program, and I want to join the panelists in thanking our senior advisors to this panel. We have them for every panel. I have a Susan Thornton uh, uh, and Arthur Krobler were, were, were the commentators on this one. Uh, we hope you will all join us next week. Uh, and for the three weeks thereafter, we've got two down, four to go in our six. We'll take you right up to the eve of the election when we'll find out who's going to be making China policy uh, for the next four years in the United States. So thank you all. Hope to see you next time. Thank you, especially panelists. Thank you, audience. <laughs>